Greetings, Flesh Wound Horror Freaks, and welcome to a brand new Flesh Wound Horror. I am Flesh Wound Dan, joined by producer Todd. Good evening. Uh, so, guys, tonight we have an actress spotlight for you on Brigitte LaHaye. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with that name, she's uh, well, kind of known for a lot of different things. Her adult film work, of course, throughout the uh, 70s and 80s and and onward but uh, also uh, probably best known I, at least for me how I first got to know her as uh, a uh, horror starlet of uh, in France from the great uh, Jean Roland uh, films like Fascination a personal favorite of mine uh, The Escapees Night of the Hunted uh, she uh, quite quite an interesting career because she did a whole lot of stuff it kind of reinvented herself, as you'll find. We're obviously not tackling the entire career. In fact, uh, uh, you could do a couple shows just on her Jean Roland work alone. But uh, tonight we have some new films from Severin, and we're going to cover those, the brand new Blu-rays. And we'll kick it off with one bit. So before we get into this one, Todd, you you messaged me uh, when this went up. The film is uh, Je Brûlé de Partout, uh, which uh, is also known as I Burn Everywhere, uh, among a couple other titles. And you told me, like, you better get jump on this fast. And I'm thinking, like, it just went up. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Uh, and uh, credit to Todd. I wouldn't have had this if I waited much longer. I think there was, like, what, a... A few hundred or something, and I think I told you when it was right around one eighty. It was yeah. somewhere in that uh, area. Yeah, and then uh, I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, like, well, that did probably okay for a while, or it's a mistake. And I'm seeing it just slowly go down, and I don't think it was more than an hour. No, it wasn't that long. Because yeah. you know what? I think I might have mentioned it when it was around five hundred, but it was like at that point, it wasn't really like, oh, well, there's five hundred. You got a minute. Yeah, yeah. Because, I, I, go ahead. Very weird. Uh, maybe it was well, a slip cover that did it, which I we will not be showing the, it, the slip Well, cover. you can show it out of the slip. Because there was yeah. 1,000 units, that's it. There was no standard edition, and it wasn't going to be repressed. Yeah. So, the 1,000, that was it, so people just jumped on it. There was another one that went pretty quick, but it was a slip cover. Only a did like the only thing that went away was the slip. I want to say it was Forbidden Love. For, yeah, mm -hmm. it was Forbidden Love from Canadian International Pictures. That one, the slip cover sold out super fast. Yeah, that that's insane because I would say a thousand's an awful lot uh, for this, which will well, we'll get into baseball it. cards at this point. <laughs> that someone, is true. Someone posted in the group today that basically someone must have got their package from Vinegar Syndrome and they sold them all to like uh, uh, one of the like Second and Charles or one of those stores. I think it was like half price books, actually. And they were all slipless. So whoever it was and these are like the brand new ones. They must have got them, kept the slips and sold the discs. <laughs> I was like, wow, that is bizarre. Like because you really don't get anything significant from well, a half price book so well if it was uh why not just subscriber people just don't want to take the hassles a lot of times well, that's true i guess but, but <laughs> i was just like damn okay that is that is bizarre uh remember guys it's about the movies first and foremost i don't quite i have a hard time wrapping my head around these i made 200 dollars on slip covers this past week so not hating on anybody but if like anyone it... needs the hearst from vinegar syndrome i got one. <laughs> oh, the hearst is that one of the more valuable ones blood beat the hearse um those are two those are two of the top ones right now i mean blood hooks always been the most expensive yeah but yeah yeah i've got some of those but i i, I am keeping them it's nice to know you have money in the bank i suppose but uh yeah well anyways guys so this is now a very rare film uh but it was a very rare film before as, as we'll get into uh so yes uh je brule de part two from 1978 and um uh and of course uh director 
uh, Jess Franco. And <clears throat> you pardon me one moment. Sorry. Uh, Lorna and Tom are a couple of low-life hustlers who make a living in the skin trade. Setting their sights on the naive Jenny, they coax, be they coax the beautiful virgin home from a nightclub for an evening of debauchery, only to drug and sell her into a white slave net network. Fucking Tinder. However, they quickly discover that her father is a millionaire and hoping for an even bigger payday, decide to demand a hefty ransom. But now they're left with the problem as they must kidnap Jenny back from the pimps who now own her. Uh, all right, so uh, this is actually uh, Jess Franco using, uh, I believe, a one-time pseudonym for him, uh, Jacques Acrog. And uh, he. this is a period... Probably, well, no, not probably. Definitely a down period for Franco. He was just coming off of his uh, two or three year run with Erwin C. Dietrich, the Swiss producer, oh, yes. who uh, really saved Franco uh, from uh, bankruptcy and a lot of financial hardship that he was going through at the time. And basically used him as his in house director for a few years. Uh, this was. A period, maybe arguably the most popular period, depending on on the fan, uh, where he made uh, Jack the Ripper, Barbed Wire Dolls, uh, Ilsa the Wicked Warden, Voodoo uh, Passion, Voodoo Passion, Love Letters of a Portuguese Nun, um, Blue Rita. Uh, this was very a very popular time. I feel like a lot of those films, at least when I talk to fellow Franco fans, are some of their favorites, especially in terms of, of sleaze. When you talk Ilsa, the wicked warden, which is a blast. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think definitely one of Lena Romay's best roles in that one. Barbed wire dolls, of course. Um, and you can go hear us talk about him. If you go, uh, go into the archive, <laughs> you, you can in a slightly lesser video quality on my end at that time. But nonetheless, that was a very good show. And I encourage you to check it out. Uh, so yeah, uh, the previous year, the Jess Franco Irwin C. Dietrich relationship had ended in uh, 1977, and uh, Jess was kind of in a a bit of a slump here. Uh, he made three films for producer Robert Denell Denessel. Not sure exactly how to say his name, but uh, they they were all very poorly financed as uh, this particular film company was dying at the time. And in 1978, he makes the three movies in 15 days. <laughs> that is insane. Um, and this was the third, all basically made with the same cast, same shooting locations. Uh, this is said to be the best of the three films. Uh, the other two were... Uh, cocktail special and uh, Els Fantu. Uh, apologize to any any French person that's hearing me butcher their language here, but <laughs> but this is widely considered the best of the three. Uh, very similar storyline in uh, Blue Rita. Actually, the whole sexual aphrodisiac uh, uh, storyline that he's used. If you, I've seen the vast majority of Franco's 200 plus films at this point, I can actually say that, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of gaps left. There's, a, there's some, and he does revisit a lot of similar themes as we'll, we'll see tonight with some of our other films. And uh, yeah, here he goes with uh, blue Rita. There's a lot of uh, crossover, the detective character, Alperia, uh, who, has appeared in all sorts of Franco movies and uh, has been played by many different actors, Howard Vernon, of course, uh, Antonio Mayans, uh, and Franco himself, who played the character in uh, his film Downtown. Um, so is this a good movie? <sighs> no. <laughs> it's, again... It's hard for me to dislike a Franco movie. It is a bizarre obsession. I just find the guy fascinating. I find his career fascinating. 
Uh, this is a very, very cheap film, and it shows. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, extremely, extremely low budget. And, you know, Franco does his best with it. I've always said Franco's a very good director. You don't make over 200 films in a career, which is is shouldn't even be possible uh, without having some talent. But I there it, there's a bit of a cult behind this one because it's basically never been available anywhere. It played a few weeks in uh, Paris and was basically gone. Uh, this is one that you had a hell of a time getting a hold of. So I, I think maybe that added to some of the obsession of this film. Franco's become very well represented on Blu-ray and now 4K, as we'll talk about later. Uh, and this is one that's that's been on that checklist for a very long time. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, as far as the film goes it, it itself, um, not particularly... Uh, erotic to me i mean brigitte looks amazing um you know uh, <laughs> you get uh, some some unusual things from a franco film there's a a gay character which once again as we'll talk later usually gay characters in franco films were very uh stereotypical and played for comedic effect for the most part so that was something a little bit uh, different in this one. Uh, we do get to see Susan Hemingway, uh, who is gorgeous, playing the daughter. Uh, some of the, the sex is a little bit on the bizarre side. Uh, we see, uh, for some reason, I guess they figured, like, oh, they want to see Susan Hemingway pee. Uh, so there is some uh, pee stuff in there. Not, not uh, too gross or graphic, but... Uh, Nonetheless, I was like, no, it's an interesting way to open this film. Um, there are some funny moments. Uh, what happens to Hemingway's character when she reveals she's a, a virgin uh, kind of made me chuckle. I mean, it's a sleazy film. If you're into these actresses, it's it gives you the basics of what you want to see. Um, but... Yeah, as far as Franco's catalog goes, I, I, I don't think this is going to be anybody's favorite movie. If you are considering dropping the insane amount of money that this is already going for... Just uh, hit me up. <laughs> yeah, I hit Todd up. Uh, I'm on the fence. It's, it's going for a yeah, good chunk of cash. It is going for a very good chunk of cash. Uh, then, hey, go for it. Will I be selling mine? No. But I am a Franco aficionado. I love Jess Franco. I have the books. I've got the uh, the movies. I have the. I even have some autographed items. Well, the one Jess thing Franco, with the but... the Pulse releases, people got to remember, is they do come out region B. So if you're not region locked, they're they're they've all been the same releases, just under the Pulse label and not the Vinegar Syndrome part, partner label. So there you go. See, that's it, my thought. I can sell the current one off for who knows what and get the other one for like 30 bucks when it drops. Yeah, that might be a good option if you have a, a region free player for sure. Uh, there's not a whole lot, like I said, to say about this one. Um, there's more titillating Franco material, certainly. Uh, and maybe for me, I don't know. This one didn't kind of get me going or anything, to be honest. But uh, there's some what the fuck moments. Uh, the whole uh, the ending, I thought, was pretty twisted. Uh, where uh, a certain character comes to a certain comes to a realization. Um, but as a whole, uh, you really don't need to see this one. Quite frankly, uh, it'll probably be our shortest review tonight. Uh, if it's yeah, if you're kicking yourself, don't uh, unless you just have to have it all. In which case, well, uh, hey, get out that 200, 300, whatever. Come on, hike it, hype it up so they come and buy my give Todd, <laughs> give Todd five hundred dollars 
and he will give it to you now. He will even throw in a sticker. Uh, he will kiss the slip case for huh? you if you oh, want. I got a sticker. Where, where's some stickers here? There you go. We we got a RoboCop one. There you go. <laughs> or, Five. A, or the super rare purple Severn one. <laughs> super super rare. That super is rare. that is at least a six hundred dollar value that you can have. For five hundred dollars, a measly five hundred dollars, and you get the RoboCop sticker. I mean, come on. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm not so. I mean, hey, it's sleazy, it's nasty, uh, it's just not overly compelling. And I, yeah, uh, certainly, I, I don't think uh, Jess Franco is overly uh, happy with this one um on the extras front you do get an interview with jess franco biographer stephen thrower which runs uh 25 minutes always very informative one of my favorite uh authors out there there's also an interview with bridget lahey uh that lasts 12 minutes uh some interesting uh, stor stories about her relationship with Franco, which uh, was not didn't get off to a particularly good start. There was an argument about her uh, shooting an adult film uh, that they had a falling out. She left for Paris and or left for uh, Port or they were shooting in Portugal and then she went back to Paris because she got pissed off. Uh, but it didn't stop her from working with them again, as we'll see. Uh, she uh, also worked on Dark Mission, which I, I kind of suspect there might be a Blu ray coming of that at some point. Uh, with uh, uh, also with uh, Christ Christopher Lee, Chris Mitchum, who also worked with her, and another one of our films we'll talk about here in a bit. But having said that rating this one uh, boy it's tough uh i'm a two and that's pretty bad for a jess franco aficionado i thought i was gonna be the low one on this but um i'm a two myself i don't yeah. disagree with whatever you you know what you said mm -hmm. it's just the rewatchability factor on this one's pretty low yeah unless you're doing like a you want to rewatch all of franco's films i mean then yeah uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it's yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely not a good one if you're just trying to get into Jess Franco. Please yeah. uh, do not do that. There's a lot of uh, good entry points depending what you're into. He's tackled every genre, so think, you know. I there's think we got a, a decent entry point coming up later. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that. That's that probably yeah one of his more accessible mainstream film. I was going to say main, as, as not yeah. mainstream as the film is, but yeah, it definitely would fall in that for uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So uh, moving on to our next film from 1986 and director Mike, Mik Mikel Caputo, female executioner. And in Female Executioner, LaHaye plays Detective Martine Savignac, Savigno, uh, a tough vice cop who specializes in busting the most extreme pornographers. But when a porno queenpin snatches her kid sister for revenge, Martine will take on a city full of pimps, pushers, human traffickers, the Chinese mob, and every man she can. <laughs> All right. So, uh, female executioner uh so at this particular time uh, lahey was kind of trying to shed the adult film star uh image kind of trying to become uh a cynthia rothrock type uh and is she a, is she cynthia rothrock definitely not uh I think this one's a little more accessible. If you like Brigitte LaHaye, uh, like if you're a big fan of the Jean Roland stuff, obviously this is very different. This is more of a cheesy 80s action film. Uh, it's a good way to see her in a different light. You still see plenty of her, 
there's a lot of sex in here. The director uh, is also from the adult film world. It's kind of, uh, yeah, kind of basically a, a sleazy Italian uh, policia film in, in a lot of ways. It's French, except it's yeah. French, but very much in that vein. And uh, so for this one, I'd say if you're if you're just looking for a great action flick, a great 80s action flick, you might be a little bit more disappointed. Uh, I would say that uh, I would recommend from Severin Siege, which I do think is a legit yeah. gem that a lot a lot of people should check out. Uh, if you like biker movies, uh, Stone is another one, the great uh, Australian biker flick. So I, I don't I don't know that this is going to completely please action fans that have no concept of who Brigitte LaHaye is. Um, but having said that, it still has a lot going for it. I love Brigitte, so I, I had fun with it. Uh, it. It opens with the plenty of terrible 80s dance club <laughs> footage, <laughs> uh, uh, all sorts of you know, crazy villain, kind of a, uh, kind of like just a, this, this wild kind of butch villain, uh, that was a little bit different from, uh, typical villains of the times. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that particularly stands out in this one, but it's reasonably well paced between the, uh, the sex stuff and the shootouts, the motorcycle chases, um and yeah i had a good time with this brigitte lahaye was never meant to be a cynthia rothrock though no. <laughs> i i don't think that was necessarily going to happen for her and there is more adult film crossover because richard allen who plays walter in this was also an adult star who appeared in several of uh lahaye's more erotic uh triple x films um Todd, where did this one fall for you? Was it a first time watch? No, I've actually seen it before. I didn't realize I had. Um, and I'm kind of with you. Are it, it's if you're going in for a pure action movie, it's not that. Like you mentioned, Cynthia Rothrock. Um, I did have fun with it, but I think you know I'm the right type type of audience, kind of like yourself for this. I think. I think if this came out through vinegar syndrome, everyone would love it. But <laughs> if this one, but it's not going to get talked about because it's Severn. Um, it, it's worth a watch, but um, I'd say, yeah, if you're already a fan of hers, I think it's going to play a lot better. I, I agree. If you love her and you've never seen it, I think it, I would highly recommend it. And this is one. For the longest time, it's just been like gray market, French VHS uh, sort of releases. So yeah. uh, it's certainly going to be an upgrade. You've never probably truly seen this before unless you saw it way back then. Um, and, you know, there's there's some laughs to be had. This is in, in no way a boring film. Uh, I just, again, if, if you're uninitiated, I don't know that it's going to blow your mind um yeah. and you could say that really about even the like i absolutely adore the gene role and stuff uh but not necessarily everybody the pacing may not work for a lot of people i think fascination i mean my god uh, i don't know if it was the first la Haye film i saw but i absolutely think that one's fantastic and uh i think she is fantastic uh, so I enjoyed this one. I had fun. I, I'm not at all sorry that I picked it up, but yeah, it's middle of the road. There's probably stuff on the Severin site right now that the majority of you are gonna gonna prefer. So so far, yeah, a little bit niche. Uh, just depends how much you you love the lady. Um, yeah. On the Extra side of things, we have uh, Cop and Nylon Stockings, which has an interview with the director and LaHaye, very informative. Uh, we have a brief uh, locations visit that runs a few minutes. 
Uh, we have blue shutters, a 1987 a Brigitte LaHaye short. And uh, yeah, it's a very good release. It's This film's never looked better, probably never will look better. So uh, yeah, I'm happy I grabbed it, but I don't know. Kind of that, that cross between cheesy action film and erotic film. Um, there's there's better options probably for both, but for the very specific audience, which is me, uh, I did enjoy it a lot. And I give it, for me, a three. How about you, Todd? I'm actually dead on again. I'm, I'm a three on this one too. Sweet, sweet. All right. So I think our last review will probably be the most... Uh, uh, meaty review, probably. I don't know, maybe not. But uh, uh, our next one, which is kind of the one that I think a lot of people have seen. Uh, yeah. I run a couple uh, Jess Franco groups, like on Facebook and different social media. So I, I do communicate with some different Franco fans. And uh, uh, Faces was kind of the first one for a lot of people. That's. That was it was just the one that for whatever reason I think probably that first Shriek Show DVD caught their eyes and uh, yeah. this is the one that they that they grabbed. Well, I mean it has more of a slasher you know thing going on the the cover. Yes. This one you know generally appeals to not just Franco, Franco fans, which a lot of his stuff, but um, this appeals to uh, your average horror fan too. Absolutely. And if you're unfamiliar with it, this is from 1988. And once again, of course, uh, director uh, Jess Franco. And in this one, a model named Barbara Hallen, played by the great Carolyn Monroe, has disappeared and her father gets private detective Sam Morgan to go to Paris to find his daughter. Barbara's trail leads Morgan to a plastic surgery clinic owned by Dr. Flamand. Morgan's investigation reveals the horrifying secret behind the doctor's miracle cures, which is blood and organs taken from kidnapped young women. As Morgan's investigation closes, closes, witnesses are eliminated one by one, each in a more horrible way. Uh, all right, so Faceless. Uh, this is really probably one of the last budgets that Jess Franco had. We... We were talking earlier, ten years before, with uh, Part Two, uh, where you know Franco was uh, really pinching pennies to make these movies. Uh, Faceless, Faceless has a big budget. Certainly, the best, the well, the biggest cast of uh, names that Franco had ever since. You know, probably Jack the Ripper, uh, and you know, going back earlier, some of the stuff he did with uh christopher lee but you have uh helmet Berger, the great austrian actor in this you have brigitte LaHaye once again uh you have carolyn monroe telly sabalas chris mitchum um lots and lots and lots of names in this movie which uh, uh it's pretty impressive like i said once again uh franco went through a period where for most directors, when you kind of start to decline, you don't usually crawl out of that. You just, kind of, you know, that's that's that period. But budgetary wise, he managed to do it. I should also mention Anton uh, Differing playing uh, as he always did a Nazi, and he plays that quite well. Mm -hmm. um, so in this, Franco revisits his awful Dr. Orloff, which was his breakout film from 1962, uh, something that he would do quite often, uh, even up towards the end of his career when he was simply, you know, at that point shooting movies basically in his house. Um, he always insisted that uh, he wasn't ripping off Eyes Without a Face, although the, the timeline with that doesn't quite add up. He claimed he was shooting this at the same time, but uh, at least as far as records go, I think Eyes Without a Face was two years earlier. Uh, but Awful Dr. Orloff is a great movie. I do enjoy that one uh, a lot. Now, in this one, uh, yes, I think this is going to appeal 
the most to the more casual fans. This is very much a slasher. Uh, at times, it almost feels like something Lucio Fulci might have done towards the end I of his career. I think we're using the word casual fan a little too loosely because I'm yeah. not going to show it to a, a normal person <laughs> and be like, this well, is going to be great. Normal uh, by flesh wound standard. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. This is not, <laughs> this is not triple X. All the Franco sleaze is still there, but it definitely cuts away before it gets a little too uh, bump and grind. Uh, I have a lot to say about it. Uh, but before I do, I got to say, this may have uh, one. It hasn't aged well, but <laughs> in terms of uh, its uh, political correctness, but there is a very uh, flamboyant character and his henchman who is called Doodoo, uh, <laughs> a bodybuilder who has a fight scene with Chris Mitchum. And that whole thing had me in stitches. I've watched this before, obviously, but every time I revisit it, I yeah. laugh my ass <laughs> off. It is hilarious i don't know how somebody in the wrestling world hasn't just stolen this todd <laughs> we need a character and we need a, a bodybuilder type dude a henchman named doo-doo uh well, send the notes to brian cage done <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure that would go over very well uh brian uh we, we, we got one for you doo-doo uh but yes, uh, as far as we, I was gonna say, we can't it. do Vince McMahon voice anymore. Now we have to do Triple H you know, voice. That's bizarre. <laughs> I was about to do it, and then I'm like, uh oh, doesn't matter now. You can't do that anymore. You got to do uh, uh, the game. Uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this I think will please a lot of slasher fans. The kills are extremely gory. I reference Fulci because we do get some eye trauma. That scene was really, really cool. Uh, Kruger's not on tonight, but if I had to recommend a Jess Franco movie, this would be like the one I would recommend to Kruger, uh, being a big slasher fan. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good entry point for sure. I mean, limbs are removed. You still have the sexploitation uh, elements in there. Uh, it's funny. I was at a convention panel with Carolyn Monroe years ago and brought this up and she was super nice, but you could tell like, Oh, I didn't think I'd be talking about that. One. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty hilarious. I think I made uh, poor Carolyn Monroe a little bit uncomfortable. The cast really elevates this one. Cause again, helmet burgers is amazing. Uh, Anton differing, uh, is Dr. Moser. He kind of played a very similar role in uh, 1960s Circus of Horrors. Once again, he always kind of played those those Nazi villains uh, in, in, a, in everything. I mean, he was forever kind of typecast. And uh, um, yeah, I really like this one. I think it's, I think it's just a lot of fun. Um, Again, not normal people, but but slightly more normal people. I think this one's safe to to recommend. You can just say for your 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 typical horror fan, <laughs> not your your weirdo one like Dan or not, us. <laughs> not weirdos like us. I'm saying us because I know you love. This I one said too, us. But, yeah. Um, you know I love my exploitation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, and Franco wasn't was never really known. I mean, he hates this film, as you might expect, because he was not known for like elaborate, uh, over the top gore effects. Um, you know, you see that uh, Bloody Moon is the other big I was one. Say that that's um, the other one I was going to say for Kruger would be a good entry point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's other times he's used gore. Uh, you know, some of the cannibal stuff, Jack the Ripper, but but he yeah, was never a slasher guy. He was never a slasher guy. He hated gore. He hated zombie films. You know, not, he, he's famous for saying that he did not like uh, George Romero's uh, dead movies. Uh, and I, I always love that throughout the years on extra features where Jess would be very open about what he did and didn't like, whether it was his own films. Uh, uh, you know, uh, he loved his jazz. He loved his music. 
uh, much like a David Hess, who uh, I did, I did have the pleasure of actually having some conversations with David Hess back in the chiller days. Uh, you know, some of his movies that it wasn't like his most proud thing. He was really about like a lot of his music. Uh, not to say that he didn't, you know, enjoy some of his work by any means, but, but yeah. So um, with Faceless, he kind of, this is around a time, even though his budgets were much less in the 80s, generally uh, speaking, uh, he he had more freedom before this during his Golden Films International uh, run. Uh, and uh, he was making a little bit more triple X at this time. Uh, certainly Lena Romay was as well. Um, but uh in uh, 1986, he kind of got a budget with Dark Mission, which I re re referenced earlier with uh, Brigitte LaHaye. And that was kind of more of a U.S. style uh, action movie of the period. And uh, when uh, uh, Rene Chateau hired him for Faceless, uh, Rene did interfere. He was very hands on. So certain things in this film who knows it, it, you might like this film more because of Rene Chateau's interference it might depend who you ask in that case but uh but yeah um Franco I don't think was used to people messing with him there were there were a lot of points where I think he wasn't bothered he got his films out on time and on budget and uh, yeah, so he had to adjust to that. I wonder if that's probably why his his German run of films, the the Dietrich ones, mm -hmm. are uh, so good because he kind of reined him in. I don't know if I want to because he the work he did in that era. I mean, story wise, visual. I mean, I don't think Dietrich interfered as much. Like uh, here, he definitely had interference. Right. I don't. I don't think Faceless is necessary. Is at, at all like pure franco i think there's he, he would rather make other things but well yeah yeah but it is it is one of the more accessible ones yeah. uh, when when anybody asks me i i try and figure out what they like first of all and that's easy if they're big slasher fans i'll recommend bloody moon or this um but if they like sleaze, usually the safe bet is Ilsa the Wicked Ward and Barbed Wire Dolls. I always throw those two out. Uh, but this one, I think, is just a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, and to, to live in a world where we have Faceless on 4K, the first Franco 4K, I think, is, is just absolutely insane. Uh, we get great villains, interesting characters. Howard Vernon has a cameo as uh, Dr. Orloff, which is always uh, a delight to see. Lena Romay is in this for about two seconds, but it's literally two seconds is uh, uh, in the uh, scene with Howard Vernon. Uh, having said all that, yeah, I really, I really love this one. If you're only going to get one, this would be the one to get. Uh, it is a little more expensive, obviously, being a 4K, but uh, I think this one might surprise you guys. I think you'll have a lot of a lot of fun with it, um, and it holds up great for me. Gory, sleazy, well acted, great characters all over the place. Uh, this one, this one ranks pretty high. Not at the top of my list, though. Uh, that would be a long video, but I swear one day and i'm not putting any kind of a time limit on it i'll do a franco tier list it's a show i've wanted to do for a very long time but i can't do it until i've watched them all it, minus the ones that were never completed but it, with the exception of that i'd have to be able to say i've seen them all and i'm just not quite there yet um but yeah todd where, where does it rank for you this is definitely one of the higher ones this is one that it doesn't really feel like a Franco film as much as his other stuff. Yeah. But I think that's actually a positive for this one for, you know, slasher fans and others. Um, it's one I don't think is a good entry point. I think it's a safe bet, but as an entry point, it's not Franco enough. So you might get lulled into a different idea of what Franco is. You watch this and then you watch uh, 
booty shorts of the living dead and you're wondering what <laughs> this uh, is what everyone's talking about um yeah but no this one does rank high um i don't think it's his best but i i do think it's a, a fun movie yeah. great cast yeah i i i totally feel like at least maybe half the people watching this might actually if they watched them all would say this is like top two or three yeah so, like, it's definitely top yeah. five for me I'd have yeah. to really sit down and think, but mm-hmm. you know that he's got a lot of sleaze stuff that would rank higher for me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. no, ab- absolutely. And uh, yeah, you know, I love my Vampiros Lesbos. Uh, she killed an ecstasy. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of avenues, like I said, with that you can go go down with with Franco, which I still find him absolutely fascinating. Look into the Stephen Thrower books. Uh, his two. Most recent ones on Franco, I think, are still in print. They're not super cheap, but uh, certainly they will be collectibles at some point. I'm such a big fan. I bought a couple extra in case the books got damaged. So uh, stay tuned to the stay tuned to the channel. We might even have a giveaway at some point. They are big, big, bulky books. Uh, uh, I cannot show the front cover. Uh, can I show the back cover? Uh, yeah, back cover safe. So, I think you showed it to us before in a different show. Yeah, they're they're very very big books. Now uh, you have so. to show me the front off air. <laughs> and I will show you the front off air, Todd. Uh, great reference guides too, because it, it's hard even for somebody like me who's been a Jess Franco fan for many many years now. Uh, it, there's so many movies to go through. Okay, what year was this? Uh, this is great. Great reviews, great information on the films. And yeah, Stephen Thrower is the man, the does authority it, when it comes to Jess Franco. Does it have an index? Because I know some of his movies have like multiple titles. Like, you, could you just. You're covered on everything. Okay. Yeah. That's what I kind of yeah. figured that, but I just wanted to be sure. Yeah, I've never met Stephen Thrower. He, he'd be one I'd just love to shake his hand because, yeah, I mean, uh, whenever I have to reference something. Uh, and again, I've probably watched as many Jess Franco movies as just about anybody, but Stephen thrower, if there's any way I can see it or have been able to see it, I have watched them, but, uh, yeah, he is the man, the authority, please look into Stephen thrower's books. He's one of the great, uh, scholars of everything that we love. So, uh, I do want to make sure I put him over because uh, without him, a lot of this information uh, would not be out there. And uh, he, he certainly should be appreciated. Uh, and all right. So on that note, uh, Faceless, let's uh, let's go ahead and rate this one, which uh, Todd, sure. or you want me to go first? No, I'll go. go um for it. See, I get stuck between how good it is and how much enjoyment I had, but I had a really good time. I'm going to give it a four and a half. I am a four and a half as well. At least I got to say that one first. So we're no, even though we like match numbers the whole show. That's why I did it, because I figured it was going to yeah, we were gonna... be the same. <laughs> Thank we're, you. we're different when it comes to certain things, but uh, yeah, we're, we're very much the same when it comes to stuff like this, You usually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, this isn't going to yeah. happen on our Blumhouse retrospective. <laughs> it, it will not. You will see plenty of fighting and well, let's name be real, calling. Dan, you're you're going to have a computer issues that night. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine if Jess had was alive to have to make films for Blumhouse? <laughs> you would love them too. I would, man, that would be tough. <laughs> like just like Jess, uh, can we have uh, you, you know? Cool it with the zoom shots. Uh, <laughs> poor, poor Lucy Hale getting the beaver shots. <laughs> <sighs> I, that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> you, you've got like Jamie Lee Curtis like yelling. It's like, John, he's got my beaver in this shot. I don't even know how he got a shot of my beaver, but he got it. Uh, uh, and then maybe he ate shit on A24 the whole time, like the, the dead movies. Uh, Dan would he, not he know would, what to do. I would love to see the Jess Franco A24 movie. I think you've probably already seen it, Dan. I'm yeah. pretty sure you got a dozen yeah. of them. 
Anna, Anna Lynn McCord. How did he get this close up of my beaver? Uh, yes. And yeah, it's a really good. You didn't even mention of... the famous beaver shot, the Franco shot. You oh, want to no, let them in what no. we're talking about, the famous Franco shot? Which one? There's so many. Well, that he'd always sneak in the shots. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what was funny about that, and Carolyn Monroe talks well, about well, it. Well, you have to say expert. what – I don't think everyone knows what what he's known for, so you kind of got to explain that before you jump into the story. He's known for sneaking in shots that, you know, were not necessarily negotiated. If you get naked for a scene on a Franco set and he says, you know, oh, we're just going to see your breasts, you're probably going to see more than just – their breasts he's he's very there's been a lot of actresses over the years that have commented on this what was funny and in her interview on which by the way this is stacked i'll run down the extras i'm, I'm not going to go over them all but uh carolyn monroe does have an interview where she said she she was tipped off to franco and she made sure she had her 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 panties <laughs> on and that she was not gonna you know be showing anything because carolyn monroe wasn't really known for nudity that's one thing that yeah. uh, she had a hell of a career for not doing it too because uh, she it, was a beautiful lady too yeah she's in that slaughter high portion of her career at this point where you know like they i'm sure she had a lot of requests to do nudity but she kind of stuck to her guns so hey more power to her um and yes so no zoom shot on on the great carolyn monroe and unfortunately uh, this does have an audio commentary with uh, Jess Franco and Lena Romay. It also has the female predator, an interview with Brigitte LaHaye, who also talks about some of the the issues that she had had uh, with uh, with uh, Franco um, and coming to work with them again on this, which was almost a decade later from uh, part two, which we talked about earlier. Uh, we also get facial recognition and interview with Kim Newman, author of Nightmare Movies, another great scholar, probably second only to Stephen Thrower. Uh, we get Parisian uh, Encounters. That's the uh, Carolyn Monroe interview. Predators of the Night. That's the Stephen Thrower interview uh, who wrote the book that I just showed off. Fantastic as always. And we get... Uh, some interviews with Helmut Berger, Chris Mitchum, Telly Savalas, uh, you know, uh, archival, of course. Uh, we also get an archival interview with Franco that's ported over from the previous release. Uh, another archival interview with Chris Mitchum and uh, selected scene commentary with Chris Mitchum. And we also get another short film, Therese to the Mission, uh, a, a short uh, film from uh, Brigitte LaHaye. Uh, so this is absolutely stacked. I think they did an amazing job on this release. I do not regret owning this one at all. And I know it's a it's a tough pitch now because we are talking a higher price point. For it's the new normal. It is the new the new normal. I've been saying that for years. But hey, Kino, you know, Kino still has some really cool shit that's cheaper. There is still cheaper stuff yeah. out there, but yeah. And when we're getting into the premium packaging and all that stuff, it drives it up. It does. I'd rather it pay. I'd rather pay twenty bucks with a normal cover than forty with eighty-five slip covers. Black this, double yeah. print. Just give me the goddamn. Movie. Can we just have like the people who want to watch? There's the collector's version, and then people who want to watch their movies, which you can save yourself five bucks and not buy the slip on Vinegar Syndrome. I I do like that they offer that because yeah. I mean, if you especially if you're making like a big order, I mean, I think I was like. 400 something something ridiculous on their last sale and there's certain things that i will still get the slip for because again hey I, I even though i don't sell them money in the bank in case i ever decided to uh but you know particularly some of the partner label stuff where i don't have all the slip covers anyways it's nice to have that option that you don't yeah. have to um so we don't usually rate just the, but I would give this one a five in terms of. Yeah, there's no argument. The yeah. package, you know, the extras and everything. I, I think this is the last copy of Faceless you will ever certainly have to own. Uh, there's till the 8K. <laughs> I don't think we're ever going to see 8K, Todd. But, uh... <laughs> not physical. <laughs> I'm sure we'll see. Uh... Well, yeah, you'll get, uh, yeah, yeah, not physical, but. Um, 
Oh, and I wanted to also, I forgot to put over the uh, Vincent Toma, Toma music in this. It's also got a really good soundtrack. Um, yeah. Uh, so check this one out, guys. Let us know in the comments if you like these films. Uh, also, some of your favorite Franco films. If you're a big uh, Jess Franco aficionado, uh, Brigitte LaHaye. Technically, this was the Brigitte LaHaye show, uh, but I always somehow segue into Franco. Well, I, I knew <laughs> it, I, we were going to have some Franco talk because we did have two Franco films. Yeah, absolutely. If so, we would have had three, <laughs> it would have would have yeah. been the LaHaye Franco show. <laughs> And at some point, I plan to have reviews for all of the Franco movies that, that I can possibly see on this channel. So if you're a fan, subscribe. Please hit the thumbs up and keep an eye out for that uh, as well. All right. Having said that, guys, that's all I've got. Good night. Thanks for hanging out with us. And check out all of our other shows this week. Good evening. <laughs>